Great. Good evening, everybody. Would you all stand with me and we'll start in prayer. Lord, I thank you um, for who you are, Lord. You're so good and faithful to us, Lord. And I thank you that we can be here with your people, um, praising you. Um, so we come before you, Lord, desiring to bless you. And um, I pray that you, your spirit would be here, Lord, that you would fill us, Lord, that you'd help us to worship you without distraction. And um, I pray that you be with Pastor Dan, that you give him the words to speak, Lord, uh, that you draw us close to yourself, Lord, that we would follow and obey you and, and honor you. And to your name be all the honor and glory. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
glory consumes like fire. What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? The holy, the holy. Holy, holy, holy. 
cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 is the Lamb. sing you are holy and you are holy, 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 but you are holy, 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 but you are holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for tonight and thank you that we can come here and worship you and praise you, Lord. Lord, you are holy. And we thank you, Lord, for calling us out of the world and into your kingdom, making us your sons and daughters through your shed blood on the cross for us. Lord, we thank you for these just sweet Thursday nights that we enjoy together. And we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name, amen. Good evening to all of you. You guys can be seated for just a moment. I have one quick announcement for you. Um, if you are in the college and career phase of life, meaning you're 18 uh, or older, you're in college or you're in, in your career, uh, there's an event here tomorrow night for you. Uh, there'll be a time of fellowship, dinner, worship, uh, a Bible teaching, prayer, and then games and activities afterwards, and that's tomorrow night at 6.30, so you can just show up for that. Uh, if you'd like more information, you can talk to Elizabeth, who has her hand raised right over here, so, uh, so if you otherwise, just show up tomorrow night at 6.30. All right, why don't you guys take a moment, say hello to each other, and then we'll get into the Word together.
Okay, if you guys want to make your way back to your seats for me, please. You all can talk after the Bible study. <laughs> uh. Okay, so hey, Thursday nights we're going through the Old Testament. We're currently in the book of Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 23. If you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bible, Exodus chapter 23. If you don't happen to have a Bible with you, just raise your hand. Somebody will put a Bible in your hand, and that way you can follow along with us. Uh, and you can hear the word and read the word at the same time. It has that double impact for you. If you don't own a Bible, please keep that Bible as a gift to you from the Lord. And please read it every day. So Exodus 23, just keep your hand up. They'll, they'll come around and, and get you. Exodus 23, Sunday we'll be back in the book of Acts. We'll be in Acts chapter 5 if you'd like to read ahead uh, so that you're prepared for Sunday. Uh, but tonight we're in Exodus chapter 23. And let me pray for us, then we'll get into the word together. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time together. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your word this evening and that you would speak to us out of this chapter. I pray and ask, Lord, that your spirit would be upon me to teach your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in chapter 20, God gave us the Ten Commandments. And then in chapters 21 to 23, God elaborates on the Ten Commandments and he gives uh, real life applications for the Ten Commandments uh, that pertain to the nation of Israel in particular. Uh, but the underlying principles that, that are in these, these laws apply to us as well. They really show us God's heart. In chapter 23, uh, we're given laws concerning the application of justice uh, or the importance of impartial justice. You know, God's law is perfect. God's law is righteous. But if people are corrupt and they um, are corrupt in the way that they use and apply God's law, and they're unrighteous, it will undermine the righteousness of the law. Or to put it another way, uh, corrupt people can corrupt the entire judicial system that God is establishing here with his law. Uh, for God's judicial system of laws to function in a righteous way, the people must be righteous. And the people must be moral and apply God's law righteously and morally. And that's not just true for Israel. That's true for every nation, including the United States. Corrupt people will corrupt a good system. The French historian Alex de Tocqueville, who visited the United States in the early 1800s and then wrote about it, uh, he wrote, America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. And for Israel to enjoy the blessings of God, they must be good. They must be moral. They must be righteous and apply God's law righteously. And so that's what he gets at here in, verse, in chapter 23. Look at verse 1. You shall not circulate a false report. You shall not circulate a false report. The idea here is knowingly or intentionally spreading a report you know is false. Wouldn't it be nice if people today obeyed this one simple command? <laughs> Don't circulate a false report. Report. Don't spread a false report. Don't spread something you know is not true, that you know is a lie. Don't gossip. Don't spread unsubstantiated rumors. 
And this, this law, as you know, it's, it's an elaboration on the ninth commandment. You shall not bear false witness and circulate a false report. The word circulate here, if you're, if you're taking notes, it means to carry or to support. You know, don't, don't spread a false report, don't carry a false report, and don't support something you know is false you know is is not true. In Proverbs, it says, Proverbs chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, but Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, listen to what it says. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, these are things that God hates. A proud look, a lying tongue, Hands that shed innocent blood, which we can do with our words. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift in running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And one who sows discord among brethren. God hates these things. It's not that he doesn't care for them. He says he hates them. He hates a false witness who speaks lies. And, and you know, as well as I know, it's so common today, isn't it? Just these false witnesses, false stories, spreading lies. You know, we're told in the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, that one of the things that will characterize the last days just before the return of Jesus Christ will be a proliferation of false accusers. It would just be common for people to make false accusations against other people and just make things up and make up stories. And the only reason that someone would circulate a false report is to harm a person's reputation for personal gain. The religious leaders of Judaism circulated false reports about Jesus. They said things like he cast out demons by the power of Satan. And they said things like he he perverts the nation. They told Pontius Pilate that Jesus is going around telling people they don't have to pay taxes to Caesar and that he claimed to be king instead of Caesar. And Matthew chapter 26, verse 59 says that the religious leaders sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. They circulated false reports about Jesus to destroy him. They violated this law, and they're the teachers of the law, and they were violating this law. In Matthew 28, uh, the religious leaders bribed the Roman guards who guarded the tomb to say the body of Jesus was stolen by the disciples. The religious leaders bribed the guards. We'll get to bribery in a minute here in this chapter. Jesus said that people will say false things about you because you're his follower. Because you're his disciple. People will circulate false information about us because you're a Christian. And try to slander you. And try to ruin your reputation because you're a Christian. And, and what those people don't realize is they're actually fulfilling the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus said when, when people make false accusations against you, you can, you can rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. And so if somebody is spreading false information about you, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. They're just building up your reward in heaven, right? Just keep on going because you're just building up my reward in heaven. He went on to say that they also slandered the the prophets of old. So you're in good company because they did the same thing to the Old Testament prophets. For us as followers of Jesus Christ, we're to always speak the truth. Ephesians chapter four says, put away lying and speak the truth with your neighbor. So you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Don't don't join with others who are circulating a false report report. Uh, You may feel pressure. Peer pressure. 
to join in with others to spread a false report or to per perpetuate a lie. You may be under peer pressure at school or some kind of professional pressure at, at work. You may be the only one who's unwilling to go along with the lie. Well, here it says, don't put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, verse 2. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. This is just great advice for all of us, isn't it? Don't follow a crowd to do evil. For the younger people in the room, you thought your parents came up with that. It, God came up with it. If all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it? Depends on how, the bridge, how high the bridge is, I guess. But, but don't follow the crowd. Any dead fish can float downstream. Did your parents ever say that to you? That's the idea here. Even if everyone else is going along with it and doing it, and you're the only one taking a stand and refusing to go with the crowd, even if it costs you relationships, even if it costs you friendships, even if it costs you a position at work or a promotion, don't follow the crowd to do evil. There's so many examples in the Bible of people who just took a stand and refused to follow the crowd to do evil. I think of the Hebrew midwives that we saw earlier in the book of Exodus who refused. They just refused to put the male Hebrew children to death as they were born. They refused to kill the Hebrew babies. Or I think of the parents of Moses who refused the order of Pharaoh and refused to cast their baby boy into the Nile River and kill him. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When everyone else bowed down to the, to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar created and required and commanded everybody to bow down to it, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused. They stood even though they faced execution in the fiery furnace, they still took a stand. And here again, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Be willing to stand for righteousness. Nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. What is that saying? That's saying don't cave in to pressure from the crowd. Don't cave in to pressure from the crowd to pervert justice. Don't back off from speaking the truth because everyone else holds a different opinion from you. Don't back off from speaking the truth because you fear the backlash from the crowd or you fear being canceled by the mob. Don't don't compromise the truth. Verse 3, you shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. Don't, don't favor the poor just because they're poor. Don't say, well, I'm, I'm going to favor him because he's poor and he's so disadvantaged. Even though what he did is wrong or even though he's guilty, I'm still going to favor him. Going to excuse him from this crime. No, his 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 poverty shall not be a factor in the decision. You shall show no partiality to the poor or to the rich. You shall treat everyone the same and apply God's word to everyone the same. And we've all seen the statue of Lady Justice, right? With the blindfold on and she's holding a scale in one hand and a sword in the other hand, and it's, it's blind justice. That's, that's a biblical idea. That's a biblical concept. In God's eyes, you apply the law equally. You apply the law uh, blindly. And listen, righteousness is righteousness. And unrighteousness is unrighteousness. It doesn't matter who does it. It doesn't matter 
who they are. You, you, you don't take into consideration any other factors or any special factors about them. Righteousness is righteousness and unrighteousness is unrighteousness. And there's no partiality with God, the Bible says. He, he doesn't show partiality with any of us. He doesn't show favoritism with, with us. He treats us all the same. Now, we come to verse 4. And in verse 4, we see that this same attitude of impartiality should also extend to our enemies. Look at verse 4. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. <laughs> you know why God says this? Because he knows you. And he knows me so well. God knows that if we see our enemy's ox or donkey going astray, our natural inclination is to stand there and watch it go astray and cheer it on. Go, donkey. Go, donkey. <laughs> go. And take out our phone. And take a video. And go home to our spouse and say, you're never going to see whose donkey I saw going astray today. You're never going to believe whose ox I saw wandering down 295. <laughs> Want to see the video? God knows us. Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. Verse, uh, verse 17 says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him. And he turn away his wrath from him. God knows us. He knows how we are. And so he has to say to us in his law, he's got to write it down. He has to say to us, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. Verse 5, if you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden. So you've got this donkey that's just collapsed on the ground under its burden. It's exhausted. It can't carry its burden. And you would refrain from helping it. You shall surely help him with it. Uh, you know, the application for us today, because I'm assuming probably nobody here has an ox or a donkey. Uh, you see someone who hates you and they're broken down on the side of the road. Don't just drive by like you didn't see them stranded there on the side of the road. You stop and you help them. He needs help. And so you stop and you help him. Listen to this verse out of Deuteronomy chapter 22. If you're taking notes, it's Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 1 to 4. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray. Listen, and hide yourself from them. You shall certainly bring them back to your brother. And if your brother is not near you or if you do not know him, then you shall bring it to your own house and it shall remain with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. You shall do the same with his donkey. So you shall do with his garment. If you find his garment, if he leaves his coat and you find it. With any lost thing, he's got to say that. Any lost thing of your brother's, which he has lost and you have found, you shall do likewise. You must not hide yourself. <laughs> you shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fall down along the road and hide yourself from them. You shall surely help him. Lift it up again. He has to say to us, if you see your, you know, your neighbor's donkey on the side of the road wandering, don't hide. Don't be like, oh, come on, before he sees us, let's get out of here. Because I don't want to have to help him with it. Again, why does he say that to us? Because he knows us. He knows, he knows you're going to get down, get down. Get your phone out and get down. Well, look at the verse again here. If you see the donkey of one who hates you, well, he hates me. 
Why should I help that guy? He, he hates my guts. God says, well, you stop and help him anyway. H- how, you, how you feel about someone doesn't determine how you treat them. How they feel about you doesn't determine how you, as a Christian, treat them. You can't say, well, they hate me. No, that doesn't, that doesn't factor into how you treat them. You show kindness. You show compassion to them. Because you're a follower uh, of Christ. You see someone in need and, and you're able to help them. You help them. Turn with me over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount, the longest teaching that Jesus gave. In Matthew chapters uh, 5 to 7. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, that's not in the Bible, hate your enemy. That's something that they said, but it wasn't in the scripture. Love your neighbor is. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. You know, like returning their donkey back to them that wandered off. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. He shows kindness and blessing on both the evil and the good, on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Anybody can love those who love them. And if you greet your brethren only... What do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. Here Jesus says we're to love our enemies. We're to bless those who curse us. We're to do good to those who hate us and pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us because that's how God is. And we're sons and daughters of God. And so we want to act like him. Now, turn with me over to Romans chapter 12, to the right in your Bible, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. It says, repay no one evil for evil. Well, he hates me. Well, don't hate him back. Show kindness to him. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, you live peaceably with all men. Beloved, Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord will deal with that person that hates you. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Hey, you want something to drink? For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. He he says, for in so doing, by showing goodness and kindness to your enemy or to those who hate you, he says, you heap coals of fire on his head. Now, what what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you, it it doesn't mean like you're going to singe their hair, right? Like now they're really going to suffer here because I'm going to show so much kindness to them that it's just going to tear them apart inside. That's no, no, that's not the point of it. No, what he's saying here is you're going to heap coals of fire on his head. In the Old Testament, God is represented by fire. For example, in the burning bush. He's described as a consuming fire. And so 
uh, by showing kindness to your enemy in this way, what are you doing? You're bringing God into the midst of that broken relationship. And, and now maybe God can use your kindness to bring the two of you back into a right relationship. Because you you saw his ox going astray and you brought it back to his house and you showed kindness to him or you saw his donkey under a burden and you stopped and you helped the guy get his donkey up off the ground. Maybe God now can restore your relationship through that. Now you're bringing God into that relationship and you're bringing the gospel into that relationship. How so? Well, the Bible says that you and I, we were once enemies of God. Colossians chapter one, verse 21 says that we were alienated from God and we were enemies of God by our wicked works. And some of us in this room, even at one time in our lives before we were Christians, we hated God. And the Bible says that we like that ox, like that donkey, we were going astray from God. Isaiah 53 says, like, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. And we were under the burden of our sin. Falling down, helpless, under the weight of our sin. And Jesus didn't just watch from heaven. Jesus didn't just take his phone out and start filming and saying, look at look at this guy. Look at what's happening to him. He didn't act like he didn't notice our situation and ignore us or try to hide from us. No, what did he do? Jesus left heaven. He humbled himself and he came down to this earth and he became a man and he dwelt among us. He took on human flesh. Why did he do that? To rescue us. And Jesus took our burdens that was weighing us down. That made us helpless and hopeless. He took our burdens from us and paid for them, dying for us on the cross for our sins, lifting the weight of sin, lifting the weight of guilt and shame off of us, putting it on himself. And so when you do that to your enemy, or you do that to someone who hates you, you're acting like Jesus Christ. You're acting the way that Jesus acted towards you. Right? The Bible says when we were out str without strength, Christ died for us. When we were just under the weight of our sin and helpless, Christ died for us. Now, look back at the passage here. Go back with me to chapter 23 of Exodus. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, You shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Now, this is the flip side of verse 3. Back up in verse 3, it says, You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. The flip side of this is uh, don't deny justice to the poor just because they're poor. So don't give them special treatment because they're poor. And at the same time, don't deny justice to the poor because they're poor and powerless. Verse seven, keep yourself far from a false matter. What, a, what great advice this is in this chapter. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Don't get involved. Avoid it. Please note the word far in that verse. Did you see how I emphasized the word far when I read that verse? Keep yourself far from a false matter. Get as far away from it as you can and stay away from it. Don't get involved in it. Even if people are enticing you to get involved in it. Or asking you, well, what is your opinion about this? Or what do you think about this? Or if it's a false matter, I don't want to get tangled up in it. I want to stay far away from it. You know, in Romans chapter 16, verse 19, it says, Be wise in what is good and innocent concerning evil. Just innocent concerning evil. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked do not kill the innocent and the righteous. Again, these are laws specifically for the nation of Israel, but they have application for us. Don't uh, pervert justice against the innocent and the righteous. 
those that are innocent of doing anything wrong or those that have done right. Don't use power to uh, don't use power against them. To try to destroy the innocent and destroy the righteous. If you kill the innocent and the righteous, what are you left with in a society? You are left with the guilty and the wicked in power. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It's righteousness that exalts a nation. But, but you could uh, use the laws or use power to go after the righteous, go after the innocent, to try to destroy them. And a nation that destroys the innocent and destroys the righteous is a nation that is in trouble. In, in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 5, you don't have to turn there. I got you. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those people who call evil good and good evil, to those who go after the innocent or go after the righteous to try to destroy them. That, that, is, a, that is a nation that is in trouble. And so he goes on in verse eight, for you shall not, you shall take no bribe for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of of the righteous. Again, God's law that he gives, it's perfect, it's righteous. uh, But if you are corrupt, you're going to corrupt a good thing. And, And here he's talking about leaders and judges who take bribes. If you have a leader or a judge who takes bribes, they will not judge or rule righteously. Taking the bribe will will blind their judgment and their discernment. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So don't oppress any strangers or foreigners that are living in your land. He says, you know the heart of a stranger. Now, the word that he uses here, the Hebrew word for heart, it's not the the usual word that's used in the Old Testament for heart. This word, uh, it means uh, life. The idea here is you know what life is like for a stranger, a foreigner, who is oppressed by the nation that they're in. You, You know how that feels to be oppressed because you're a foreigner and you're powerless because you were oppressed in Egypt. So don't do that to other people. Don't do that to foreigners dwelling in your nation. Now we come to verse 10. And in verse 10, we have laws regarding the Sabbath year. Verse 10, six years, you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and with your olive grove. And so they are to uh, farm their land for six years and then allow the land to lie fallow and rest in the seventh year. And then they, uh, they take the year off. Doesn't that sound great? I think we got a little tiny taste of that with the shutdown with COVID where we were all, you know, like you couldn't go to work, couldn't go to school. Everybody was just kind of at home for a few weeks or a couple months or whatever the case was for you, right? You just kind of had, like, we're not doing anything. You can't go out, can't go to the restaurant, you can't go to the store. We're just going to be at home together as, as a family. Well, every seven years in Israel, they were supposed to do that and take a sabbatical year, just let their land rest not farm, not work, the, not work the land, not plant crops or anything like that. Just allow the land to rest and lie fallow. This is, a, this is a law that was unique to Israel in the ancient world. There was no other ancient civilization that had a law like this. And today, of course, we understand the value of allowing farmland to rest and be replenished and replenish the nutrients 
and, and the soil. But the reason that God does it here, he tells us the reason that he commanded Israel to allow their land to lie fallow every seventh year was as a provision for the poor. Look at verse 11 again. That the poor of your people may eat. Now, farmers in Israel were not all on the same schedule with their, with their fields. So, you know, every year there were some farmers in the land that it was the seventh year of farming for them. And, and so there was always fields lying fallow for the poor. God made a provision for the poor. God made a provision to provide for the poor of the nation. Here's the thing. As long as the poor were willing to work. They had to go themselves into the fallow fields and harvest food for themselves. No one did it for them. They didn't receive a free handout. Food was available for them, but they had to work for it. To meet their own needs. You know, in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, if anyone will not work, they will not eat. And that, that concept comes from this Old Testament law. If you don't work, you, you don't eat. Provision is made for the poor. Their needs can be met. No matter how poor they may be, they'll have plenty of food, but they have to do the work for themselves. So if you don't work, you don't eat. And so with God's law, please notice this, with God's law, it, it, this, this uh, provision for the poor has this perfect balance of compassion and personal responsibility. Now, here's the thing. Israel as a nation never observed the Sabbath year. God says, I want you to take a year off. And Israel didn't. Every seven years, I want you to take the year off. Work six years, take a year off. Work six years, take a year off. And Israel never allowed their land to go fallow and rest. They never took a year off. And when they went into captivity in Babylon, they were in captivity for 70 years. Now, why 70 years? Why not 62 years or 74 years or 38 years? Why 70 years? They were in captivity for 70 years because they dwelt in the promised land for 490 years and they never took a Sabbath. And God said, you owe me 70 years worth of Sabbaths. And so God collected on his 70 years worth of Sabbaths that he was owed. If you're taking notes, you can jot down 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 21. 2 Chronicles 36, 21. It says there that they went into captivity 70 years until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. Now, they went into captivity because they had forsaken God and turned to idols. That was the main reason. But the reason for the length of the captivity, 70 years, is because the land was, you know, needed 70 years worth of Sabbaths. And so they were in captivity for 70 years. In verse 12 now, the uh, Sabbath week, or the Sabbath day, is repeated here. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. And so you take a day of rest each week so that all, everybody in your household, including your, your livestock and your animals that you farm with, ev everybody will be refreshed. And it and in all that I have said to you, be circumspect, verse 13, and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. He, sa he says, be circumspect. The idea here is uh, keep your guard up or pay careful attention to these laws that I'm giving you. You know, we have a similar command in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
Walk circumspectly. Pay attention to the world that you're living in. Pay attention to the things that are going on and going down around you. Walk circumspectly because the days are evil. Don't be as fools who are just blind to everything going on around them, completely unaware, but be wise and redeem the time you've been given because the days are evil. Here, God says in the Old Testament to Israel, you be circumspect. You, you pay careful attention to what I'm commanding you, what I'm saying to you. And look what he says again in verse 13. He says, don't mention the names of other gods. Don't learn about other gods. Or other religions or other philosophies, don't don't study other religions or other gods just out of curiosity. I want to find out what they believe or how they worship their God and what they practice. Nope. Don't do that. Don't do that. Listen, there is plenty for us to learn about the true and living God, Jesus Christ. And you can spend the rest of your life and eternity learning about him. And studying his word, which is a, you know, limitless well here. And you can spend the rest of your life studying his book. The Bible. Don't don't. Don't learn about other gods or other religions or how they worship or anything like that. Now, going into verse 14, are you guys with me? You still with me here? Is the person next to you with us? Maybe give him a little nudge. Verse 14. Now he's going to tell us about the three annual feasts of Israel that they're to celebrate every year. And they are called feasts. They're celebrations. They're not a solemn, sad, serious events. That are a real bummer. They're feasts. They're celebrations. We've got one feast in our culture, Thanksgiving. They had three, three times a year. They gathered together to celebrate and to feast and eat a bunch of food and have a good time. So verse 14, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, which remember is connected to Passover. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, which is in the spring, March, April. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. Verse 16. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labor, which you, sh you have sown in the fields. That would be the feast of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. And then verse 16 goes on, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. That would be the feast of tabernacles that was in the fall, usually around October. And so you've got uh, the feast of unleavened bread, which is connected to Passover. That's when God delivered the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt, followed by uh, the feast of harvest or Pentecost. Uh, that was when you had your first fruits, the first of your harvest from the field at the beginning of the season. It was a way of expressing gratitude to God for his provision and anticipation of his further provision for you. And then at the end of the season, in the fall, you've got the Feast of End Gathering, the Feast of Tabernacles at the final harvest at the end of the season where you celebrate God's blessing and how he has provided for you. And these three feasts, of course, find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ, right? He's the Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us to deliver us from our bondage to sin. Uh, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church. The church is born. 3,000 people are saved. That's the first fruits of salvation of those that would be saved. Tabernacles, the final in gathering when the gathering is complete. Now look at, look at the end of verse 15. None of you shall appear before me empty. Please, please note that in your Bible. None of you shall appear before me empty. 
whenever we appear before the Lord, whenever we appear before the Lord, we should always appear before him with something to give. Uh, there are many, many people who come before the Lord or they, or they come to church wanting to get. Like, what, what do you have for me? What do you offer for me? What, what, what kind of uh, programs do you have for me? How are you going to meet my needs? What do you have to offer for someone like me to meet my needs and my wants? That's really the, the wrong attitude to have. We should come ready to give. Don't come before the Lord. Don't come to church empty. Come prayed up. And filled up with the Holy Spirit, just ready to give, ready to give out, ready to give worship, ready to give thanksgiving to the Lord, ready to give praise, ready to serve others, ready to minister to others. What can I give? What can I do? Not what can I get? But what can I do? What can I give? How can I serve? How can I? Jesus said, I did not come to be served. But to serve, and that's the attitude we should have whenever we come before the Lord, whether it's in prayer, at home, or you go to a Bible study, or you come here to church on Thursday nights, Sunday nights, man, I'm, I'm prayed up, I'm filled up, and I'm ready to just give out. Give you my praise, my worship, my admira- adoration. Ready to minister to others, serve others. Always giving. Again, verse verse 17, three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. So all the males in the in the land of Israel, they shall all come these three times a year, close down the business and head to Jerusalem for these different feasts. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. Leaven is a symbol of what? Sin. Nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. Don't neglect the sacrifice, or just take it for granted. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Give God your best, not your leftovers, your first fruits, not your last fruits. You know, giving the first fruits in an agrarian society, that required faith. Because at that point, that's all you have. You've just got the first of the harvest, and you're going to give that now to the Lord, and you're trusting that he's going to provide more fruits. For, for you to harvest and for you to live off of. And so it really co- required faith to give your first fruits. And then he goes on in verse 19. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. <laughs> Don't you love that verse? It's like, what, you know, why did he drop that in there? Now, if, you, uh, if you're taking notes, this one verse, this half a verse at the end of verse 19, uh, this is where all of the kosher laws of Judaism come from from this this one verse there are there are volumes written on this one verse uh, we have a group going to Israel next week next Thursday uh, evening uh, in Israel because of this one one command here you can't boil a young goat in its mother's milk in, in Israel you can't have dairy served with meat Uh, So if they're serving meat, for example, you can't get cream for your coffee. Because cream is dairy, and so they'll serve you a non-dairy creamer or a powder uh, creamer. And uh, you you don't really realize how much you enjoy dairy with meat until you're not allowed to have it. You can't wait to get back to the airport in the United States and get a cheeseburger (laughs) at McDonald's. And the reason they have this is because... With this one command here, the thinking would be uh, if you have dairy with the meat, if you have cream in your coffee while you're also eating a steak, uh, you don't know for sure, but that dairy may be from the mother of the steak you're eating. And when you consume both of them together, then they get into your stomach together, and as your body is digesting the dairy and the meat, it's almost like you're boiling the meat and its mother's milk and there's the possibility that milk may have come from the mother of the meat that you're eating and so just to avoid that they don't serve dairy with meat uh, nor will they serve dairy with chicken you all have had chicken milk right (laughs) chickens don't make milk as far as I know they don't but you can't have dairy with chicken 
either. I don't know where they get that one from. But it's a rule. And they, they base it on this verse right here in verse 19. Shall not boil a young goat and its mother's milk. Now, this is not really a dietary prohibition. We're going to have those later on in the book of Leviticus. Those are going to come. But that's not what he's talking about here. Here he's talking about bringing in the harvest and your crops and these three feasts that are based on the agrarian you know, calendar of, of uh, when you're bringing in your first fruits and the end gathering at the end of the season. This is all about farming here. And, and the reason that God put this prohibition in his law here at this point is because they're going into the land of Canaan. And in the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, the pagan Canaanites, would boil a baby goat in its mother's milk as part of their idolatrous worship, and then they would take that milk and they would sprinkle it on their fields, on their crops, as a sacrifice to their god Baal. And they believed that god, their god Baal would cause their crops to prosper because of this sacrifice that they would make where they would boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. And what God is saying here is, is you're not to look to the practices of the heathens. You're not to look to their ways. That's not how you're going to prosper. You're going to look to me only, and you're going to trust me by faith You're not going to use these things that that the heathens use that they think prosper them. You're just going to look to me and I will make your crops grow. As long as you're faithful to me, I'll bless you. And you're going to learn to depend upon me. You're not going to use these pagan methods. That's what he's getting at here. And so verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. What a wonderful verse that is. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Now, Look back at verse 20, possibly in your Bible, your translation, the word angel is capitalized. Uh, The him and his and he is capitalized in these two verses. This is the angel of the Lord. This is the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Before he's born as a baby in Bethlehem, he appeared at different times in the Old Testament. This is what is called a Christophany. Or theophany, when when Jesus Christ appears in the Old Testament. Notice this angel of the Lord has the power to pardon transgressions. Something only God can do. Only God can forgive sins. Notice also, God says, the Lord says, my name is in him. And they are to obey his voice, this angel, this pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. He will keep you in the way you're supposed to go. He will bring you into the land that I have prepared for you as you follow him and obey him and walk in his ways. This is all pointing to the deity of Jesus Christ. We see this this angel of the the Lord appear, Jesus appear elsewhere in the Old Testament. Uh, For example, in Genesis chapter 32, verse 30, Jacob wrestles with a man, it says. He wrestles with him all night. And then after their big wrestling match, Jacob says, I have seen God face to face. And my life is preserved. Who is the man he was wrestling with? That is God. It's Jesus Christ. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, an angel of the Lord appeared, or the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush and called to Moses from the burning bush. Told him to take his shoes off because he's on holy ground. You're in the presence of God. In Joshua chapter 5, after the children of Israel uh, enter the promised land, there's the captain of the Lord's army. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Some of you remember this from the Veggie Tales movie. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand 
And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said to him, No. (laughs) I love that answer. Are you this or that? No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and he worshiped. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandals off your foot. For the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. This commander of the Lord's army says the same thing to Joshua that the Lord said to Moses in the burning bush. They're one they're one and the same Uh, in Judges chapter 13. uh, This is just a few examples Judges chapter 13, the angel of the Lord appeared to the parents of of Samson. And then in Judges chapter 13, verse 22, Samson's father says, we've seen God and now we're going to die. And his wife says, I think if God wanted to kill you, he would have done it by now. I don't think we're going to die. But he says, we've seen God, this angel of the Lord. So this angel of the Lord here, he, it is a, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus who is leading the children of Israel through the wilderness. It's the angel of the Lord that we saw earlier in Exodus that was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt to the Red Sea. And then remember, he went behind the camp. The pillar went behind the camp and, and blocked the Egyptian army. That was the angel of the Lord also. Look at verse 22, and we're almost finished here. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, notice, notice God just switched to the first person. He was talking about this angel of the Lord and what you're supposed to do and obey his voice and what he's going to do for you. And now in the middle of a sentence, God switches to the first person and do all that I speak. He just said, if you do all that he speaks, all if you obey his voice. Now God switches to the first person and then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the flashlights and the mosquito bites, all of them. (laughs) Now he goes back to the first person and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them. Nor do according to their works. Remember, he said, don't don't even mention their names. Don't learn anything about them. But you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. Back in back in Genesis chapter 15, when God was speaking to Abraham, he said that the time uh, of the of the. uh, The fullness of the wickedness of the Amorites was not yet complete. God, God measures time by mor- morally. He judges nations morally. And they were coming to the end of time for them. He, they were coming to the time of judgment. Their, their wickedness was almost complete, almost full. And now, now God's going to use Israel to bring judgment upon them because of their wickedness. I mean, they were sacrificing their children. They were in co- in involved in all kinds of perversity. Verse 25. And so you shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water. I will take sickness away from your midst. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. What a promise here. And, and the key here to Israel, Israel's victory, you know, how are they going to conquer this land? The promised land, the key to their victory will not be in their military strength or their military, military skill or their might. It will be the presence of the angel of the Lord going before them and with them. And they will have victory if they obey the angel of the Lord. And the Lord will fight for them. And the Lord will deliver the land to them and give them the promised land as long as they obey him. 
and so too with us. The promised land, it is not a picture of heaven. There are giants in the land. There are walled cities in the land. There are strongholds in the land. There are battles to fight in the land. That is not heaven. The promised land is a picture of the spirit-filled life. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a, it's a land that has basketball-sized grapefruit or uh, uh, grapes that take two men to carry a bunch of them. It's, it is the fruitful life in Christ. It is the spirit-filled life that Jesus Christ brings us into. As we abide in him and obey him, and we walk in the spirit and the promise is if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it's Jesus Christ who brings us into this life of fruitfulness, this life of abundance, this life of blessing in him, this victorious life where he defeats the giants in your life. He tears down the strongholds in your life. You don't do it in your own might. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by the spirit. He does it for you as you abide in him and you walk in his ways and you obey him. He will bring you into this full life in the spirit. And so he goes on here in verse 28. And I will send hornets before you. Which shall drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites. From before you, God God will even use hornets to drive out our enemies. His ways are not our ways, right? I would have never thought of hornets or using hornets. Uh, That just didn't occur to me to ever try that. He doesn't do things the way that we would do things. He doesn't use methods that we would necessarily use or dream of even using or even knowing that's an option. Look at what he says in verse 29. Please, please, please tune in. Listen, listen. I will not drive them out from before you in one year. Lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Look at verse 30, please. Little by little, I will drive them out from you until you have increased and you inherit the land. How come God hasn't just delivered me from all of my struggles with my flesh? Why can't he just like snap his fingers and I don't have any more struggles with my flesh, no more temptation to sin, no more carnality? Why is there this daily battle that I've got going on? Where I've got to crucify my flesh every day and take up my cross daily. Because you couldn't handle it. If he if you if the moment you got saved, he took away all all of your struggles, all of the dealing with your flesh. No, that's not how he does it. He says, I'm not going to do it in one year. I'm going to do it little by little in your life. I'm going to I'm going to drive out these things, your, your, your sin, your struggles, your flesh, these giants these strongholds, I'm going to do it little by little over time. You know, one of the reasons why he does this, one of the reasons why he does it in my life, I suspect probably in your life too, because he knows that if on the day that I was saved, he drove out all these things, he tore down all the strongholds in my life and all the giants and all the struggles and all the battles, he'd never hear from me again. (laughs) See in heaven in 50 years, you know, (laughs) thanks. Thanks. And the reason why he does it little by little is because it keeps us on a short leash. It keeps us coming back every day and multiple times throughout the day. And that's why he does it. So there's a relationship there so that you and I have to constantly cast our cares upon him. It keeps us coming back. It keeps us depending upon him and relying upon him and praying and coming back and surrendering afresh to him and asking for a fresh filling and repenting and and confessing our sins and asking him to cleanse us and to forgive us again. And all, all of that. It's the relationship. It's the relationship. Because he knows us so well. 
And so he does it little by little. What does the Bible say? He that began the good work in you, he will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He's going to keep doing this little by little in your life and in my life until you go to be with the Lord. Or I go to be with the Lord. That's just how he does it. So that there's this daily dependence upon him, this daily walk with him. And I will set your bounds, verse 31, from the Red Sea, from the Red Sea to the Sea, Philistia. That would be the Mediterranean Sea that the Philistines lived on. And from the desert, that would be the Negev Desert in the south of Israel, to the river, that would be the Euphrates River, way up in the north, way up near like Iraq. Israel has never, never uh, possessed that much land. And they have a fraction of that land now. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you as long as you obey me. You shall make no covenants with them nor with their gods. Now, when we get to Joshua, I think it's Joshua chapter 9. We're not going to get very far into Joshua. They're going to come into the land and they're immediately going to make a covenant with the Gibeonites. And disobedience to what God says right here. You shall make no covenants with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land. They're going to fail at this. Spoiler alert. If you haven't read the Old Testament, they're going to fail. Lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Here, here God says, this is why I don't want you learning about their gods or talking about their gods, because it's going to be a snare to you. It's going to be a trap. In the New Testament, we have the parallel warning. Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever because it's a trap. It'll be a snare for you. You're not going to bring them up. They're going to bring you down. And so Israel was not to yoke herself with, un, with the unbelieving nations. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the work that you're doing in each of our lives, little by little, day by day. As we walk with you and rely upon you and depend upon you by your spirit, Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we thank you for your patience with us and your daily care for us and your daily leading. We thank you for your spirit that empowers us. We thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Thanks for coming out tonight. See you Sunday morning.